Hello, Writers Guild members and fans of great television writing. Welcome to And the Nominees Are Limited Series Contenders for the Writers Guild Awards. This year's ceremony will take place in a hybrid format so that you can stream on the evening of Sunday, March 20th. WGA members, keep an eye on your inbox for the invitation. For more information on the nominees in all categories, visit wgaeast.org slash awards. Thanks to Variety and Final Draft for co-hosting this event with us once again. We're delighted to have a stellar group of show creators and scribes here with us tonight, and I want to thank them for being here. Our moderator, Esther Zuckerman, the senior writer at Thrillist, will introduce them in a moment. The senior entertainment writer at Thrillist, excuse me. Esther has lots of questions for our panel, but you may use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pose questions at any time, and she will read them out to the panelists at the end. Please use the Q&A function, not the chat function. Now, please join me in welcoming Esther Zuckerman and these fabulous limited series writers. I have to unmute myself. Um, everyone remember to unmute when we go. Um, I'm Esther Zuckerman, uh, Senior Entertainment Writers at Thrillist. Um, I'm also a member of the WGA um, in the digital side, and I did want to before we start, give a shout out to our fellow WGA members at the Gizmodo Media Group Union who are currently on strike for a fair contract right now. Um, I'm so excited to welcome this whole panel here, here today to talk about their limited series. Um, we have Ian Brennan from Halston. We have Sarah Burgess from American Crime Story Impeachment. We have Little Marvin from Them Covenant. We have Sarah Molly, Molly Smith Metzler from Maid, and we have Barry Jenkins from the Underground Railroad. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, hello, everyone. <laughs> Um, well, let's just get into it. Um, this is a broad question to start, but I did want to know a little bit about how each of you came to your projects. I know some of you are adapting books, um, Molly and Barry. I know some of you come with original, you know, completely original concepts like Little Marvin. I know some of you are sort of telling sort of these historical stories like Halston um, and Crime Story Impeachment. How do each of these projects sort of fall, fall in your laps? There's always that awkward moment, right? <laughs> yeah, who yeah. wants to kick it off? <laughs> um, uh, all right, go, go ahead, go ahead, Marvin. Who? I thought you were gonna go. I thought you were gonna say something. <laughs> no, um, it's not. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, when uh, when Moonlight was about to premiere at at Telluride, I I'd always been a fan of Colson Whitehead, and I was uh, tracking his book, so I pre-ordered it on Amazon. And my agent was like, we can get you the galley of that book. Why are you pre-ordering uh, on Amazon? And the show ended up being made by Amazon, which is uh, kind of crazy. Uh, but I, I read the galley and right away sent Colson uh, a copy of, uh, of Moonlight. He was one of the first people who watched it. And he really loved uh, the, the film. And then as Moonlight kind of did its thing, you know, everyone was after the book. Um, but uh, I had, he had watched my movie so early and I told him right away, I wanted to make it as a limited series, not as a feature film. Um, and we just kept talking. And then one thing led to another. And when I realized what was happening with Moonlight, uh, I really felt like, I think I could really get the resources to make this the way I want to, uh, because this thing is gonna happen and, and I'll be able to do kind of whatever I want. And I'd always wanted to make a show or a movie about my ancestors and it felt like this was the way to do it. What was it like for the rest of you sort of, you know, to Barry's point about finding the resources to be able to make these projects at this particular time? Well, in, in my case with Halston, it was, um, I came to it very late. This was a, this was a project that was trying to find an outlet for since the mid nineties. I mean, almost since Halston died is based on Stephen Gaines's fantastic um, biography of Halston. But the weird thing about Halston was as far as material went, he was such a, he was sort of an invention. It was, he was, what was so interesting about him to me is that he's kind of the first, one of the first like personal brands. He kind of invented that. Yeah. Now it's ubiquitous. Now it's like 
all anybody can think about. It's all our children will think about, you know, but back then he sort of like pioneered that. And so his whole persona was a bit of an act, which made um, getting to the man underneath uh, a real challenge and kind of an act of faith that you just, there was a kind of a finite amount of like work and then what you knew about him and what was sort of told about him. And then somewhere in there was like this man as well. And that's what was, um, I think, really challenging with like a, with this deep, like Shakespearean need who then makes this like Faustian bargain by like selling his name. Like it was really rich, but at really at the core was this mystery. That's what was, was so fascinating about it. I mean, Little Marvin, you're starting an anthology series. Um, Sarah, you're coming on to sort of an existing anthology series. Um, I was wondering if you both, I mean, definitely two different, two vastly different shows. Could you both sort of talk about the anthology element and coming on to it, Little Marvin finding a home for it as well? Um, yeah, I mean, it really sort of presented itself in that format for me. Uh, early on. Um, I knew that I wanted to sort of live with these characters longer and, and flirted with the idea of it as a feature, but I knew very quickly that the idea could bear out more story and that I wanted to live with these characters and invest in them for a bit longer. I've been a fan of the anthology format. I grew up like I was a kid in the reboot era of like the reboots of Twilight Zone and the reboots of Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and these were all my favorite shows growing up. So I've always loved like the limited miniseries format. And uh, we were trying to sort of set out to um, pay homage to some of the, my favorite films from the 60s and 70s, the domestic thrillers and domestic horror of that era. And so the idea was to sort of make something that had the feeling of a film, but that could like bear out um, yeah. a bit longer. So a 10 hour film. In, in <laughs> yeah. Sarah, what was it like coming on to an anthology that had sort of already existed in a much different format? Yeah, I mean, of course, it started for me with uh, the understanding that I was stepping into a franchise, you know, with producers who had made those previous two seasons. Um, and I kind of agonized over it for a month or two and as I started reading about the real events, because um, the story of the Clinton impeachment was so well covered in the 90s and, and, and actually had already been um, sort of brought up again in our national consciousness. It's like sort of 20 years after it happened. Um, and also I knew this was quite a different story from the previous two seasons. The first one's about a murder trial. The second one's about, um, among other things, law enforcement tracking um, a murderer. So I, I, I was mindful of how, how different the story was. And I think didn't, I, I felt compelled to write it when I think I found a way in creatively that felt different from what had been said before. Um, but the whole time, of course, I felt I was working in a, a situation where I felt I had to live up to something that had come before, for sure. Yeah. Molly, I wanted to ask, how did you come across Stephanie Land's memoir? Um, you know, you're also adapting a book. How did how did you come across that? I think uh, a lot of good luck <laughs> is the truth. I, uh, at the time I was working in John Wells's writing room on Shameless, I had been there for three seasons and uh, John and Margot Robbie got the option to the book. Um, and it was very competitive because, you know, I think it's just, it was a good moment for a, a female memoir about something that's so important. And like, it had been a New York Times bestseller. And so I think it was competitive, but I wasn't a part of that. I was a part of once I got the rights, then they came and they gave me the book and uh, I read it kind of overnight. And I think the reason I got it was that I had just written a play called Cry It Out that had a, a really beautiful run, a beautiful production here in Los Angeles. And it was beautiful about- play. Um, I wonder, I saw that play. Oh, thanks, thanks Ian. Brilliant. My, uh, my friend Brian was in it. Oh, I love Brian. Yeah. I miss Brian. Yeah, well, thank okay. you for coming. <laughs> anyway, so as Ian will tell you, it's about moms and, and class. So I just think like everyone in the office has just seen it and they were like, this book's about mom and class too. So it was very <laughs> kind of good luck. That's also great. I mean, I wanted to ask, a lot of you are coming to historical topics, maybe not you, Molly, but it's also this sort of, it also is a world of sort of government rules and stuff that a lot of people aren't very familiar with. I was wondering if you could talk about the research process um, and, and, how, and how you approach that, um, sort of delving into each of your subjects. 
I'll go first because I I'm all warmed up now. But I, uh, <laughs> you know, we talked about the the book was a wonderful resource because of all of the the sort of it's such a lesson in government assistance and the failure to be assistance. So the book itself is a wonderful resource for made, but the book is not about domestic violence. And um, I it's I really wanted to explore emotional abuse, which I'd never seen kind of on screen before. And so um, research was a huge part of the writer's room in our process, but I um, we worked with this great shelter in LA called the Genesee Center. And they let me kind of, they have three emergency shelters um, and they let me like fully integrate and spend time there. And um, so if it, you know, that's kind of why it started to feel real because uh, it was an incredible resource to, yeah. to, to do that. What about the rest of you? Um, how did you approach the sort of background, the, the research process of your writing? I mean, I, you know, there are probably like 30 to 40 books written about this event. So I, <laughs> I, I did, read those um there also was like you know the fbi did a ton of uh, reporting about this it's like now available and the u.s congress of course like investigated it of course the president was impeached and that led to more documentation so there was so much raw material to take in which had also been sort of again leon a fox slowburn did a really nice job of reconsidering some of that um about 20 years later um with a, a kind of good specific perspective and so it took all of that material in and sort of the writer's room um, there's a danger there that you'll write something really unfocused, um, or that you're just reporting what happened. Um, there's a temptation sometimes not to take a point of view. So I think for me, it was about finding, holding on to the sort of character voices that made the most sense and, and making sure to go as far as I could with those people. Um, and then Monica Lewinsky was a producer. So that was a whole other piece of it. Right. So I, you know, I knew that I didn't totally know how that would work when I started, but I've never had gotten notes from a real person who's a character I'm writing in my life. Um, so that was, um, I don't know if you would call that research as much as just like, it, it's a collaboration that's very intense and is going to check out you know, everything you do and you know you're writing for her. And, um, you know, I've just, I've never experienced that before in my life. It was an incredible experience. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and, and Molly, I was wondering if you could talk to that too. And actually, Barry, too, you know, you're working with Colson Whitehead, you know, obviously all very different situations, but in some ways, people who have this primary sort of source relationship to the text you're adapting. Um, obviously, Molly, you were not writing Stephanie, you turned into character Alex. And, but what was that sort of relationship like in the process? in the process of writing. Barry, please. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, uh, Colson didn't want to have anything to do with it. Um, <laughs> he said it, it was it was kind of cool because I we had just made a Bill Street talk and I thought, oh, this is great. Now I'll, I'll have the author and he'll, he'll be here and we can <laughs> we can send things back and forth. And he was like, no, I wrote the novel and now you you guys are making the show. And he was writing another novel that won uh, another Pulitzer, yeah. so, so he was right to, to not focus on our limited <laughs> series. But um, but it, it was really cool. Uh, one, because the book existed, there was just so much research he had done, and he turned over some of that. Uh, and then the uh, the uh, the WPA Federal Workers Project uh, collected all these testimonies of uh, of the last sort of generation of people who had lived uh, uh, during uh, uh, the condition of American slavery. So we went into that. But then what was cool was because Colson took the railroad and actualized it, it kind of freed us from real history. And looking into the research, we sort of realized that there were only three or four pockets of research because so much of the, the lives of these people, of my ancestors just lost the historical record because they weren't yeah. allowed to record them for themselves. And so we were like, oh shit, we're just gonna start creating. You know, we're, we're, we're creating these lives. And it was really cool in the writer's room, which was, you know, a new experience for me. I've always written alone. It's kind of dope when you've got six other smart ass people who are helping you figure things out. Um, we just looked at Cora, our main character, and was like, what if Cora was someone like Harriet Tubman, who people have written all these narratives about, you know, what are the avenues that you want to explore, you know, the most interesting uh, bits of her life. And so we actually got off of research and started just building uh, this mythology. And it was it's interesting our show is quite heavy but it was fun in a way doing that work um just because yeah. it was like you know Colson had done such a such a really good job of, of realizing the character and, and grounding 
this really fantastic thing. And then we got to go in and just just play a bit. So yeah, it was, it was really cool. Well, and Sarah, I want to come back to asking about that, but I, I did want to bring little Marvin in because you're also dealing with the past, but element, you're also bringing in sort of mythology and demons and supernatural elements. What was that like for you? Um, it, it was, an, it was, it was, it was unique and interesting and, and, and the most exciting adventure of my life, frankly. Um, I started this journey in my bedroom um alone this is my first show <laughs> so like i was a i was a guy who was just nerding out on history and i was reading just tons and tons of books and i knew i wanted to play something during this era um and i knew i wanted to place a black family in particular at the heart of the kinds of stories i've loved forever but as i sort of kept peeling back the layers and layers of history of this time i began to like sort of focus it centralize it into the real estate um part of the story and into the sort of the american dream of home ownership which as i read read um, more and more and more. It, it was revealed to me that it was anything but a dream um, for Black folks in this country. In fact, it was a nightmare. And so it lent itself very easily to being a terror story. Um, I realized in doing that too, that I had never really seen, or I was desperate to sort of see a story that took place during this time that um, explored the sort of the emotional and psychological and even spiritual fallout for having overt racism surrounding you at all times of the day and night, at home, on your front lawn, at work, at school. And I'd never really seen something that, that had dealt with that from a sort of a psychological and supernatural perspective. Um, and yeah. horror has always had a really wonderful way of, of being allegorical and, and, and allowing you the sort of entry point into some rather deep and thorny topics. So the journey sort of started there um, alone. As I said, I want to come back to the question I asked earlier, um, Molly and Sarah, and I wanted to bring Ian in as well. Um, I'm not sure if you had any sort of access to any of the people who are still alive who are around Halston um, when working on the show, but, you know, obviously, Sarah, you have a very unique experience of working directly with Monica Lewinsky, um, and I'd love, you to, I'd love if you could speak on that and then everyone else join in about your experiences working with the, these people. Yeah, I mean, I, I you know, I kind of decided early on for me, the kind of my entrance as a writer and sort of my my instincts took me to, I, I felt like the key to the story um, was Linda Tripp, who's this woman who secretly recorded Monica Lewinsky when they worked together, in case anyone doesn't know that story. But I, um, <laughs> and she, um, you know, who sort of was considered to be the big villain in the 90s. So when I, it came time for me to meet Monica, I was terrified because I didn't know how she would feel about that. Um, and we started in earnest, you know, we, we were sort of, we would meet with our producers, you know, Brad Simpson and Nina Jacobson together. So I, I didn't get a lot of time with Monica alone at the beginning. Um, eventually what, what happened is that she would get, you know, I, I wrote the first three scripts sort of early on my own and she would read, read those scripts and eventually her written notes would filter back to me. Um, and so, you know, that was a, a, you know, something I adore about Monica, it, you know, it was true of the character then and true for today is she's a extremely direct and honest person. So, you know, you, you read those notes, you can compartmentalize your own emotional response. And to some degree, like any note you get from anybody, you decide, um, you, you decide what feels right to take and you sort of, you process those, of course, a note about her own internal experience the you know it's a person 20 years later but this person saying what they actually felt or correcting my uh the thrust of a scene or sort of what, what she was inferring my interpretation was um i took that heavily into account and made a lot of you know changes for that reason as i as we moved forward um i would consult her sometimes as i was writing or i would want to press on a certain thing you know she and i would sort of zoom privately this is all during covid and i was um in production a lot so i would sort of be zooming from my sad little office at fox and, um, you know, by the end of it, it was sort of, um, I think we, we established a, a process that allowed her to say, I mean, I don't, I don't want to speak for her. It felt like she was saying a lot of what she was thinking and feeling about it. Um, and then I would sort of go off and process that and send it back to her and make sure before we shot that I had sort of all of her responses and everything. I think I would have been pretty uncomfortable if I didn't know how she felt, particularly in a scene, of course, involving, involving her, if that makes yeah. sense. 
Can I just say that I admire Sarah because I was watching the show and also watching Monica's Twitter feed. And I was like, I don't know that I would have wanted to, to make the show <laughs> knowing this person not only exists, but this person is like, I mean, the center of so many emotions. Like, I mean, just hearing you talk about that process, it's, it's crazy. I, 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 every time an episode would premiere, I would wonder like, what the fuck does Monica think of this? And who is she calling right now to go? To go? <laughs> I didn't do it that way. Well, me too, Barry. And that means a lot coming from you. Thank you for saying that. It was an incredible it's experience. It's legit, boss lady. <laughs> Molly, how closely were you working with Stephanie um, to tell a story of a character that wasn't exactly her, but was based on her memoir? Well, like Barry, I kind of lucked out because uh, it's not that Stephanie wanted nothing to do with it, but she did deeply understand that it was going to be hugely adapted and fictionalized and that it was a different lane now and it was not a lane she was gonna be in. So that was sort of wonderful because it, it's very, as we all have, it's very freeing when you have mm -hmm. that kind of power in your own creative process that you aren't worrying about <laughs> how your lead is gonna feel about her portrayal. Um, but I also, I wanna say that Stephanie was actually surprisingly wonderful and I say that because I feel like I've heard nothing but kind of horror stories from fellow writers and she was a real friend to our process and I she allowed me and John Walls to come up and invade her space and she spent a bunch of time with us and she showed us all the real places that she wrote about in her memoir I called it the trauma tour but she spent five days like walking us through everything and when I say that it was so much worse in person than it was in the memoir and it was rainier and moldier and harder and darker and more depressing and more more unfair. And so I kind of came back to LA, like really motivated to capture, to capture her, that slice of experience for her. And I feel like if she hadn't given us that, um, that time and that love and, and, um, and it just trusted us like that, it was really special. And she also came and visited in LA and came to the writer's room. And even though she didn't read scripts or anything like that, she, she sent us a lot of trust and love and that goes a long way. So yeah. Um, this sort of speaks to what Barry was saying about the pressure of having Monica Lewinsky sort of some public figures, but um, I, I wanted to ask for um, both Sarah and Ian, you know, you're dealing with moments that like, you're dealing with figures who are iconic and loom large in cultural memory um, at Halston. Liza Minnelli. Um, That's the thing. Just, That's who we kind of were worried about running a foul of, which was weird. La, uh, was yeah, Liza? We're like we can't, like Liza Minnelli can't, she can't hate this like we knew it would just like kill the show she it was he was her best friend like they were like family um and she's characterized too yeah. like, sort of uh, uh, she's sort of a much caricatured person um you know and struggled with addiction and stuff so all those things had to be like uh not kid gloves we just wanted to be sensitive and just not be exploitative or whatever and sort of um and know that like she um I mean, luckily we had just like the most spectacular performance in the actress, Chris Rodriguez, who played her, which was like wonderful. uncanny, like weird. Cause even writing, I was like, I don't know who we're going to get to do this. Like that's a <laughs> tough, tough line between like caricature, same thing that, that Ewan did. Like really these people who, you know, these sort of like larger than life figures, it was really, a, it, I was like, well, I'm writing this, but like, it's not a challenge to write this because I can hear them. They like, no, you know, it's mm -hmm. really easy to write Liza Minnelli. It's really easy to write. Halston but another thing to like pull it off um and in the first god like five seconds of each performance you're just like oh they got it yeah totally got it. uh like I don't need to worry at all um you know Chris Rodriguez did like a, a full Liza with a Z like pull I even when we were writing that I was like I'm not I was gonna get cut like, you can't do a whole <laughs> so it's not like we're not a musical and then it's like suddenly it was really uh exciting so hopefully um you know and it's a it's a it's a someone who's deceased too like it, it was actually interesting like by the end you know, there's just a lot of guesswork when it's somebody who's like gone um but then by the end you're sort of like writing you're like oh he'd never say that you know like it is which is a weird it's really weird like i'm not met this guy i didn't know very much about him when i started you know so like i was so it's somewhere this this character that you're making is somewhere between you and the truth and is somewhere in between and is neither probably but it is just I guess sort of like an act of like 
faith or like empathy to just try to, to just try your best to get them. And then it somehow works. You get something. I'd be really, I remember at the end, uh, we sort of portray the man's death too, uh, obliquely and tastefully I thought, but like, um, I was like, Oh, I hope, I hope he's happy with this. You know, it felt, it was, a, it was sort of like heady to be like, Oh, sort of writing this, like what's meant to be this sort of like definitive take on this guy. Like, I hope, I hope we got it. Um, I think the actors did. I, I hope, I hope we helped them. Yeah. I mean, Sarah, were you also wrestling with, obviously you have the subjects that are still alive, but like wrestling with this idea of, you know, like, you know, as iconic as Liza Minnelli is, so is Bill Clinton. And how do you write someone that people who, who people hear their voices in their heads when you say their names? Yeah. Bill Clinton and Liza Minnelli always being compared with each other. Yeah, obviously, <laughs> clearly. <laughs> <That's> um, just... <laughs> I, <laughs> um, I love that. Um, you have to turn off some of that self-critique, I guess, just like anytime, even if you're writing about yourself, I suppose. Um, I think that I... So I, you know, I think if I had thought too much about also just let, you know, not let's not even get into, all the, I mean, all of these stories contain things that we all have a lot of emotional baggage around. I think it's, yes, I think perhaps like the, the specific person of Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and Monica, because they are so um, with us and active in the world in their ways, and they are just specific, you know, human beings who are going to go out and do things and people have such strong feelings about, you know. Um, I, I think only after we stopped shooting and the show came out, did I sort of, especially I think talking to people in different generations, did I understand how intense people's emotional baggage was around this event? And, and of course, obviously around politicians. I mean, that's what politicians are basically, someone to project our own uh, ideas onto to some degree and reflect our ideas or whatever. But um, to back up in writing it, which is what you actually asked me, sorry, I think, um, <laughs> I think with the Clintons, it's just, you know, as Ian was saying, there's a, there's a voice and how, how they speak, but even then you're seeing them behind closed doors. We're, we're not seeing, I've talked to a lot of people who have spoken to the Clintons or whatever. And, you know, you, you hear stories about how they are. I've never met uh, either of them, but um, there's some conjecture there for sure. You know, and I think it, it felt different writing Linda Tripp, Paula Jones and, and Monica uh, versus those, the Clintons in that, in that way. Um, I think you have to turn off the sort of, my sort of battering, sort of self-criticism where I just wouldn't have gotten anything down. And as Ian said, you sort of hope that they may not be happy with it, but you hope that it's, there's something truthful there, you know? Yeah, certainly. I wanted to ask you all about sort of format um, and how you thought about, you know, working within the format of the limited series. Um, you know, Little Marvin and Sarah, you start in both of your series start in media rest. You sort of drop the audience into one moment and then move forward and come back. How did you think about that? How did you think about sort of playing with this format? Just speaking briefly, then I'll shut up because I'm talking too much. Um, the With Halston, I think part of the reason why they struggled to get it made was because they were starting to get it made before the limited series was sort of a thing again. Um, and as a feature, it's a much different thing. It would actually be a hard story to tell. You'd have to, you'd have to sort of like, you'd expand one of the episodes. You'd, may, you'd maybe make it about like the, the, the fashion thing at, at uh, the, the big event that sort of made his yeah. name at like uh, uh, the Palace of Versailles. Um, to me, it was suddenly like, I, I, this was an example. I was just like, this is just a better, um, like Marvin was saying, it's like, it's a 10 hour movie or a seven hour movie. It's just, it just a, like a superior medium. I just felt so um, relieved to be able to have the, the, the breadth to tell the story in that length of time. Yeah. I was wondering what the rest of you, how the rest of you approached it. I would just, I mean, I've said it before, I'm obsessed with this format. So I, I yeah. it really wasn't a question. I do think like, 
um, structurally, and I have to call out our team, like our team of writers who were just fantastically brilliant and um, and we learned so much together, but we, we certainly, we, we attempted anyway to articulate it around a very specific kind of structure, like we knew we wanted to get you in there with the family's experience for like the first half. And it was meant to kind of almost feel like a roller coaster ride, like you go up and then at the, there's a very definitive point in our show at which you get socked in the gut. And then from there, yeah. it was sort of a descent into hell, <laughs> depending on, <laughs> but depending on your opinion, the descent into hell might've started at the very first episode, but like, but like that was the, the ambition of it anyway. And so the structure kind of led uh, the structure and then just knowing that we were going to tell again something that felt akin to a 10-hour film um, yeah kind of coalesced yeah well very obviously you come from the world of film and, you, and you, you mentioned that you knew you wanted to tell this in a tv format rather than in a film format what why was that why was that uh part of it had to do with just the subject matter um you know the film or the theatrical release is a very captive experience you know you sit down in the middle of a big room you turn your phone off you're surrounded by strangers the screen is super large you can't stop it or start it so i wanted people to have control over how they uh how they receive the show and i knew there were going to be some very hard images but also some very soft images some really beautiful images and i thought compounding those into a two-hour format uh, it wasn't going to let the the soft images speak as loud as the hard images. So I said to Colson right away, it had if if I was going to adapt the book, it had to be a limited series and not a feature. And if you wanted someone to make it as a feature, that I was not uh, the right person. And so that was the uh, the the thinking going into it. Once we got into the room, uh, it was fucking awesome because you know our 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 show moves. You know, it's a uh, Charlie Kaufman always says it's a movie. It moves, and in this case it's a journey, you know, she is yeah. going through all these different physical states and emotional states. And so we had a lot of fun, uh, just trying to figure out how to immerse the audience, literally suspend them in space is the opening image. It's a yeah. Suso and Joel just falling uh, into blackness. Uh, and then we actually, we were like, also the, the whole point is the direction, not the destination. So we just like, we're just going to send people through a series of images. We're going to show you a lot of shit that you're going to see over the next 10 hours, mm -hmm. right up front. And something about that gambit, rather than it being uh, being intimidating, you know, I like to say, where's the quote I like this, uh, in fear we shrink, in love we expand. And we thought we're just gonna embrace this shit and we're just gonna hopefully through the work just expand. So yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool. I wanna remind people, um, our viewers at home that they can submit questions um, to the panelists for via the Q&A box on your screen. Um, and we'll get to those eventually. Um, just posing a little reminder there. Um, well, I, I did want to, sorry, to stay on Barry for a quick second, because you have this incredible 20 minute episode in the middle of, you know, you're in the middle, Fanny Briggs, um, in the middle of the series. And I was wondering if everyone could also speak to this idea that, you know, obviously, you know, some of, Sarah, you are working on actual television. <laughs> Your show is being broadcast on television, which none of the rest of you were, but like mm -hmm. how the streaming landscape sort of changes your ideas of how you can sort of mold and mutate what, you know, used to be like, oh, let's do a 45 minute episode. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, I'll, I'll step in first. For me, it was awesome because <laughs> I knew I'm gonna have really intense hours here and an hour there. The audience yeah. needs a break, you know, mm -hmm. and they need a release. They need some catharsis and just dropping in for 20 minutes, 17 minutes of catharsis. It was like, it was really great to have that freedom. Also out in the field, um, speaking as a director now, shooting uh, the show that we had written, um, it was nice to know that we could dedicate a bit more time to this thing, knowing that this slot is being held by something that on the page, I think the script was maybe like 12 pages and it timed out at 17. You know, the two shortest episodes were written by the two most junior writers, and they were episodes that I could not write myself. Our writer's room assistant, assistant actually wrote this episode called The Great Spirit because she was this big Faulkner head. And I thought, oh, I think someone who loves William Faulkner is gonna do a good job with this episode. You go off and write it. It's like her first writing gig. And I don't know, it was cool to, to say to the studio, yeah, it's only like, a, the script was like 25 pages. It's only a 25 page episode. And then it ends up being, you know, this 40 minute really compact thing about fathers and sons. So I think having a bit of freedom in the format, uh, it was great in the writer's room, but also great out in the field directing. 
Yeah. Well, to that point, what you were saying about, you know, your junior writer taking this thing, what was it like for all of you building these, building your writer's rooms? Who, how did you think about sort of thinking who you wanted to help tell these stories and, and how, you, how you wanted to collaborate in these processes? I can certainly speak to that because I, to the point we were just talking about with, with the structure informing you know, um, format, I think that there is definitely a version where made as a movie. Um, it's not a version I wanted to write at all. Um, but I wanted to write the 10 hour version because I wanted to write about the cycle of abuse and how you get stuck in it. And in order to achieve that, we needed to get stuck in it. You have to spend an entire year with this character. Um, and I also knew going in that we were never going to leave her point of view which is a crazy decision to make because it was 10 hours long. So I knew off the bat that this was going to be um, really about the character and, and I am a playwright. I know Sarah's a playwright, but I hired almost entirely playwrights because I just felt like we all spoke a similar language and I sort of treated these 10 episodes as 10 plays, which only backfired on me one time and it was on my episode, so it's fine. But <laughs> but like- how do, you, how do you mean it backfired? <laughs> Uh, it, it backfired a little in the in the finale because I was like, I don't want to write a play, you know, and, and so it had to have that. I had to. It, it's hard to explain, but I was like, I don't want to wrap everything up. Someone else write this. But it was my my problem. <laughs> my problem. <laughs> but, you know, I think that what I am so proud of about Made is that I do feel like the chapters feel different. And like ch chapter five, episode five, um, my husband Colin wrote and that it's a haunted house and it's eerie. And like the way it's, we had this beautiful theater director come and do it, Lila Neugebauer. And it feels like a different show than four. And it feels like a different show than six, where there's a dance sequence where Margaret Qualley breaks out and dance. And so I felt like for me, like bringing different voices who are all like not afraid to be a little bold was really important. Um, so that's what I look for. Like people who, who, when we pitched the couch is going to eat the character who would think that was cool, not scary. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love the, I, I did want to ask you about that, um, about that Molly, which is that I loved the idea that you're telling this very you, you know, this story very re rooted in reality and rooted stuff, but you do have these moments where you're breaking from reality. And I think a lot of shows, a lot of the shows we're talking about do this. Um, you have, you know, when she's at the lawyer's office and she go and where she's at the, um, in the courtroom and she just hears legal, legal, legal. Um, you know, you have these moments um, like that. Sorry for those who haven't watched the show yet, please watch and you'll understand <laughs> what I'm babbling about. Um, but if you, what, how does the medium sort of give you these opportunities to do that? Obviously, I mean, Barry, you're working from Colson's book, which operates on this magically, with this magical realism sort of at its core. Um, how does the medium sort of allow you to play with that and bend reality? Um, I don't know. It's, it's super, super malleable, uh, much more valuable than a, than a feature, I think. Uh, because every time the credits roll on a new episode, or I guess when the, the five second ticker ticks down <laughs> an episode, um, yeah, you have the license to, to create a, a, new, a new world. I think in our case, because um, you know, we tried to break this down in emotional states as well as physical states. Every time Cora gets to a new place, one, the location changes, the whole acting mm -hmm. troupe changes. And so the whole tone of it can change. And our writers had way different skill sets. You know, we had a couple of junior writers. Uh, we had a, a young woman who had just graduated from uh, NYU playwriting with an MFA. We had this guy, Nathan Parker, who wrote Moon. These are just very different uh, voices. And I, had, I was a staff writer on season two of The Leftovers. Uh, only made it 20 weeks, but you guys all know what that means. Um, I was booted out of the room and didn't get to do a damn thing. But uh, Jack, Jackie Hoyt uh, was, uh, was one of the producers uh, on that show. And so she came with me to make uh, The Underground Railroad. And she really ran the room. You know, I was there to do all the creative stuff and whatnot, but Jackie was the vet and she just knew how to keep us on task. So yeah, it was, uh, it was really cool. You could throw people at certain tasks that suited their uh, their strengths more. And then people would surprise you. You know, the young black playwright from NYU was the person who broke the, the racist white dude going home to say goodbye to his dad. She broke that episode. And I was like, holy shit, didn't expect that, but thank you. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to, I, I, I wanted to ask Sarah, you know, what, 
I, you know, it's interesting that we're talking, you know, these streaming, streaming allows these, you know, a 20 minute episode here, obviously a, obviously something that's being broadcast on FX does not allow that for, um, what is it like sort of working in that, working sort of in that context? It seems it, it shouldn't be so unusual, but in this panel, it, it, it is, um, <laughs> Well, first of all, all of my scripts were too long. And um, I like I feel like I'm now obsessed with writing like a like eight minute TV show episodes or something in some form. So I I wasn't I wasn't as policed as you might think, but yes, at the same time, I didn't have the um I didn't have the option to look at the sort of length of an episode as I, I couldn't alter that obviously for episode just to state the obvious as I was working on it. And I guess I did. Now that I'm saying this out loud, I realize I probably I was thinking about act. Wait, so there's no act breaks in streaming. You just write. No, there's no act breaks. Okay, so that's a big difference. So I don't know what I'm gonna do now. My eight minute, my my. Can you, like my minutes, two minutes. you can also be like an hour and five minutes. Like you can kind of. <laughs> well, yeah, and I remember I that that underground road. Yeah, so of course, yeah. So um, nice. I um, yeah, I don't. You know, I, I I should. It's probably an important piece of information that I had never. I've never really written for TV before, except for one pilot. So yeah. this is the only thing I know. Um, so I don't, I'm kind of like speaking to you from like the 1990s appropriately, because it, to me, it's, it's the norm. And I, it, it sounds fascinating to not be operating in those constraints, you know, but I had to do it here. And that's sort of what the experience was for me, if that makes sense, you know? Yeah. Certainly. To me, it was wildly, do it's, you, you still want to be careful of length just for, um, the, you want it to still feel like an episode of television, but like I, for six years was with, Glee, we, I mean, it was the tyranny of like a 43 <laughs> and a quarter minute episode to the yeah. dot. Mm -hmm. So it would often be like you'd, and, and and then it would sometimes be that like some of the most successful episodes or the things I thought that was were the funniest would always go long a bit. And there was just no, totally not fungible at all. Mm -hmm. Like you could not mess with it. And then you'd watch the final cut. You'd see like the assembly and you'd be like, great. The final cut and you're like, oh, I cut everything that was great about that so to just not have that is yeah. is great mm -hmm. i think the temptation is then sort of be like well there's no rules but it still does there's some there's a feel to it you can still feel when something's too long and even if it's all, like a lot too long by two minutes it's weird yeah something yeah. weird happens right around 55 56 minutes where you go introducing story or evolving story at that point it's like ooh, it's just got to be good you know it's no i totally i think you're right and because there's an instinct to almost like tee up something else or to put on like a like a weird button or something and so so sometimes they'll feel like they have like even watching cuts back you'll be like oh we put in like four endings here like probably yeah to do that I'm sitting I, I wonder here why that is. you both and literally taking notes. <laughs> you know, you know, it's no, interesting I, I, we, we, we had probably four of our 10 episodes are over an hour. Some of them are like 63 minutes. One of them's like 77 minutes, but intentionally it's the typical episode nine, big blowout. Uh, but a couple of them were just, and this is where, because uh, I think, I don't know if anyone else directed their shows, but budget wise, we had to, smash two episodes together and that episode unfortunately had this problem that we're talking about ian where it's the only episode where the character leaves one place yeah. arrives at another place and then leaves that place i'm talking about episode three and i was like fuck this didn't seem like it was going to be over an hour but it's like mm -hmm. i have no choice she's got to get there she's got to get out and i was like you know what maybe if i was a better director, you know, I wouldn't have gotten to this place. Uh, but then I go, wait, as a writer, you had to smash two episodes together, like in the last minute. So give yourself a break. You're probably a plenty good director, but I take your point. <laughs> the, the, the main thing too, is that like, uh, it was, um, the constraint is then budget. Mm -hmm. You're still, you know, like you can be as long as you want, but you still have to like sort of hit those marks, even with, you know, you know, most Ryan Murphy stuff has like, um, a certain, is like, they're, they're pretty liberal with budgets and he's he's happy to sort of be like this is what it costs click so you know there's no you know like he he's a great like 500 pound gorilla to have and is is usually right and particularly with something like Halston where it's like um part of the joy of it is like to to luxuriate in the look and the style of it like that's the whole point like you you can't yeah. keep out 
but then you'd sort of, and it'd be the line producers of the UPM. So you'd get on the call with, and they'd be just like trembling, like, uh, well, <laughs> way, way, way over. And then they'd be like, and sometimes you'd just be like, okay, we could cut that, cut that. And then they'd just be like, one of the things they say is script relief, which just mm-hmm. means like, this scene's so long. Like that's going to take like half a day to shoot. Can you just like do, and then that, those are always the painful ones to me. And I'm like, oh, I've just been long winded. I'm like, mm-hmm. bye clever quips mm. bye, bye. But, yeah, that's funny i know this came at a different point in the process for most of you but i was wondering how casting sort of influenced the writing process sort of whether you knew sort of been cracking a character what you might be looking for and you're dealing with you know you have you and mcgregor on board to play halston like you know how did for each of you how did sort of thinking about casting and wh- whoever may be attached sort of in, work its way into the writing process for me it's like you uh you just it's just in it helpful particularly if you got somebody attached you can just hear them there's less like guesswork it's like a really um it 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 just like puts you on third base um and then sometimes like once you then start seeing dailies of somebody that you've cast you maybe are not familiar with their work like that really informs itself but um and then with Halston I actually tried not to just looked a little bit at what Ewan was doing but I don't didn't want the feedback loop. Like if something's working, you're sort of just like, oh, okay. okay." Like, I just want to like, I think I've got it and I don't want to play into what he's doing or fight it or whatever. But to me, it's always, always helpful uh, to know who it is as as you're, before you're writing it. I can say with Maid, uh, Margaret Qualley was the first person we cast. Um, And once we heard her read it, no, no one else could read it. Like she was so amazing. And she was better than the role is the truth. And so then what happened is we were shooting it for, I mean, I moved to Canada for nine months and it was she and I and the director and a skeleton crew in the rain all day. And what happened was, you know, I started writing it for her, not necessarily like she's not a writer, but, but I wanted to give her the material she deserved. And like, I just had so much respect for what she was bringing to the role and doing. And she, I think she raised the bar of the writing for all of us in the writer's room. We were like, oh, she's she's an artist. You know, she's not just an actor. She's also an artist. Like, cause sometimes you get that, like, you know, I, I've worked with both and and um, it's a real gift when you get someone who like her, she's such a talent. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Does anyone else want to weigh in on, on this one or should we move on? I think, I think Sarah kind of has to weigh in because I, I just, <laughs> I, I just, I, again, I'm just kind of, cause I, I was in high school, I guess, when, when everything happened with, with Bill Clinton and, and Monica uh, Lewinsky. And I, I just thought when I heard about the show, who was going to play this person? And I'm just curious to now it's just fact finding mission. At what point was Beanie cast? Were you guys still writing or did you just know? um yeah I was I was writing well it was pretty early I think it was like um there's a phase where I was writing in like we works in New York I think it was when I was writing one through three and I think the, the producers were you know the idea came to me I think that like that there was a lot of interest in Beanie and I was really excited by that idea I think she I thought about her but too and um it was murky for a moment if she was officially doing it, but I knew, I knew, I think pretty early on that it would be Beanie to answer your question. And then um, I think particularly for that part, I then did really have Beanie's voice in mind and Beanie in mind for the rest, the rest of the way, you know, I mean, it was exciting because it's not something I had seen her do before. Um, and then production was quite delayed because of COVID. So by the time we really started, um, everything really was, everything really sort of was complete. I think I had met her once for like a lunch or something, or she came to the office, but mm because everything stopped so suddenly, um, there was a whole stack of overlong scripts by the time she got to really do it and I got to see all that she was doing with it. Yeah. Barry, I did want to turn the question back on you because Thuso is such an incredible discovery. Um, she's, she's such an incredible actress who we didn't really know before. And how did you, you know, obviously Cora was such an important role, but you know, at what point did she sort of come into the play? Yeah, we we had already had um, the the pilot and a couple of episodes uh, written by the time we cast uh, Tuso, but I was curious to hear 
Ian and Sarah, because because I I just don't I don't hear people uh, when I'm when I'm writing. Um, uh, but then as a director, once people are cast, um, as Molly was saying, then I, I just can't not hear them. And so yeah. it's things where, especially with this format, because you're you're filming for so long. You know, when Molly said nine months, I was like, yeah, I know what that is. <laughs> yeah. um, we had an episode with Damon Harriman and, and Lily Rabe, and they were just fucking amazing. Really was and it was like, it made me go, oh, I, we have to write this better. We, yeah. we have to give them more because yeah. they are just like, it was just something so wonderfully intense and intimate about about how they were expressing themselves and it's something that that's why when you guys said you hear people in your heads i was like oh i wish i could do that i could get that ahead of time you know because yeah. usually it's like once the people are there in the sets then all these things just start firing and so for me with the casting it didn't doesn't really affect the writing but once once i get there on set with the person then it's just like fireworks yeah well, Marvin, I'd love for you to weigh in on this as well. Um, you know, obviously you you had so and you're also casting kids um, in these key roles too. And how did that affect? Well, I, I mean, I was told quite literally, don't, <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't write these roles, uh, particularly for the age that they were. I think uh, Gracie mm. Jean was meant to be six, seven, mm. um, and I was just told you may want to consider <laughs> making her older. <laughs> And, but I, I just couldn't. I mean, that's that's the age that she was in my mind. And, yeah. and then it was just an experience of literally seeing, I mean, so many people before the right people walk in. And it feels fairly impossible, frankly. The, the process yeah. was impossible. And then suddenly the right person came in. It happened with Deborah. It happened with, with Ashley. It happened with Jeremiah, who played the tap dance man, and Allison Pill. Like, suddenly the right person walks in and everything makes sense. It's just mm -hmm. sort of magical. And you feel again, like it's just not going to happen. And then they make everything better, frankly. They elevate it. And then that was the experience, the same experience. I, I We cast them and then suddenly you're writing because they're finding so many things that you just yeah. want to do it in service of them, frankly. Um, so yeah. Well, I think we're going to move on to some audience questions now. Um, I have my little Q&A box open. Um, the first question is from Malcolm Mays, um, and who wants to know, how does one choose when a multi-generational story should be told as a miniseries outside of a typical five-season series and or movie? I think we sort of addressed the movie part of that um, a little bit, but what, how, what about instead of, you know, more seasons? <laughs> Yeah, is it, I'll, I'll, I'll be really quick. I was talking to a, a, an actor yesterday about this. And she has something really smart to say. Uh, and I don't know if it holds up for every uh, serialized show, but she said, there's just a way that characters move and behave when you know you're going to be with them for five years, for five seasons, versus how they move when you know you were with them for these 10 episodes or these six episodes, and this is it. It's, I don't want to say it's closer to cinema, and the things you can do, at how interior you can get and how ununiform people's arcs can be from episode one to episode five. But to me, that, that's the difference that, 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 I, that, that I felt in approaching it. Yeah, I think yeah. I'd say that like episodic television to me is like, and both half hour and hour at the comedy and drama, you're building a widget. You're building a machine that can, can put out story it's tricky it's a weird and it's trippy i didn't even realize that's what it was until like year four of doing it like oh that's what we're doing where you actually like like following story is actually kind of your enemy you really have to meet out what kind of uh, advancing the story the, the the greatest example is like gilligan's island where like literally not the same thing happens every episode and that's sitcom <laughs> but it's like the same sort of thing happens yeah. similar with glee where it was like, you kind of can't advance the story too much, which we absolutely did all the time, but then you're constantly painting yourself in a corner. With limited series, you're, 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 uh, it obviates that concern. Like suddenly you're like, oh, just tell the story and you can be as, you can pace it the way you want. Um, sometimes in almost every, every, uh, every time I've done it, it was just like, this is the third, maybe this is the second. Uh, we've incorrectly guessed how many episodes it would take. <laughs> like could be like oh this is just seven like it's not eight and then like that call of, like can we just do seven uh <laughs> but to me that's the, that's the difference that's actually why it, it's similar to film um and different from a multi-season thing 
Um, I also just want to say hi, Malcolm. Yeah. He's one of my writers on season two. Oh, okay. <laughs> Extra <laughs> points for tuning in, Malcolm. <laughs> hey, that's amazing. Um, I did want to, um, actually, one of the other audience questions sort of bounces well off what you were saying, Ian, which was, uh, if this is actually from an anonymous attendee, but before you write the pilot for a limited series, do you break down the entire eight to 10 episodes to understand what the pilot is? I'm so curious to hear what you guys do. <laughs> I, I, my answer is absolutely not. I, absolutely not. I can't, I can't think that far. And if I do, then I'm so in my head that I lose the creative thread entirely. I have to, there has to be a process of discovery. Um, I, I mean, of course you're pitching out, like, I think it's, this is like with Made, we knew the final image where she was going to end up at that M, you know, and I was able to say that. I knew what the climax was going to be and I knew the shape of it, but like, um, there has to be discovery or I just can't do it. I don't know. What do you guys do? Are yes, you same. It's hard to hear that. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, I, same same because I like I was like I can't tell the truth here and so like, <laughs> generally not and it's terrifying it's like jumping out of an airplane um also because like the people who are producing these things really want to know what you're making you know <laughs> like, they actually care way more about the series whereas like I can kind of only think in like episodes and oftentimes like can just think of the pilot and then they're sort of like okay what do we do next? And it's like a, it's a very, it's, it's an, it's a not unterrifying process such that when you get to like end series, you're like, don't know how we did that. Like, can't, <laughs> can't really remember what the process was. Like, it's just very, very like amorphous and mysterious, but it's, I don't know whether it's like a, it's a, uh, a right brain left brain thing or something but it's like yeah I, I um yeah I, you know where you're headed and for, particularly with this example of like Halston like he dies you know like it's like you there is an end there is an end game but in between is like just it's like uh, like wandering through fog yeah I'm breathing uh, such a sigh of relief hearing you guys say that. So the experience, I, there are landmarks at best. There are I landmarks. Don't know, I don't know how people do it. That's why I was hoping one of you had done it. So. <laughs> I mean, I'll say we we had to we had to pitch the entire show front to back twice before even going to pilot. It's so um, exhausting. It's like that's harder to do than like just doing the show. It, it, like, it, it, it oh is. Oh my god! Like, can I just write the scripts? Yeah, and like explain them and make them seem like exciting and sort of like because you have to it's just it's just a very very again it's probably like a it's like a midbrain thing but but that's that's the hardest part of like the whole thing I well very oh sorry i didn't want to interrupt because but i just wanted to throw in one of the other audience questions because it sort of speaks to what um, Barry was saying, um, Jenny Lynn asked, did you have to pitch your take of the series at the start? And if so, could you talk more about it? So I was, so maybe all of you could sort of weigh in on the pitching process. Yeah, I mean, we had a super short, uh, we had a really tight, compact room because I fit this in between uh, uh, the whole Moonlight Awards thing and then going off and, and prep for a Bill Shrieka talk. So we had like a a 10 week room and we had to we had to pitch this at four weeks then we had to pitch it again uh at, at week 10 the whole thing front to back um but, but part of that was i you know again the because at that point we had one best picture it was like oh shit you got a blank check you can cash it on anything and i was like yeah i want to make a 10 episode epic you know about the condition of american slavery and i want to make it at a certain budget level that it's gonna be fucking just like unimpeachable from the from a craft standpoint um and still to secure that even with the shiny gold dude uh we had to pitch that shit twice uh in 10 weeks front to back and some of the stuff from that process is definitely in the show but you just like you guys are all saying once you're like in it and your location you've got the actors and boom, boom boom then it all just starts to to mutate and morph but the only way to get the green light was to go through that process man front to back uh, twice in 10 weeks God, that's I, 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 Ian I love your face man thank you it's all well, no it's just it's like a lot and I get it I actually get it I mean like a 
everybody like they're putting a lot of money in these shows these things are not cheap they're super risky most of them lose money or viewers or whatever it doesn't hit them don't hit the marks that they want so i get it it's like and and you're trying to everybody you're like mostly the people who you're talking to are, have to also sell it up mm-hmm. so they're on the line too like i'm i'm totally sim- sympathetic to it but it is it's just so hard and you'd think there would be a level at which you could i'm not there at all but like where you would just be like there you go write the check but it's it like isn't and partly it's like because you're gonna have to do that work anyway and it's you don't want to do it because it's hard but it's like so i i get that they want to hear it maybe just to hear it but also like to make sure that you're doing it you're sort of like then once you've done that i would imagine barry that like the actual writing of it isn't a sort of like ah it's a more organic the thing sort of emerges because you've done all the hard work and you've like you've built the skeleton and the rest can sort of emerge from it I imagine that's like how it is but it's um it's just a it's just a um it's like that 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 uh that quote like every unhappy family is unhappy after his own fashion I feel like every show is like uh, a sui generis process there's like no rhyme or reason to it it's um it continues to 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 baffle me actually little marvin i'd love to hear from you on the pitching process pitching something that's not based on pre-existing material or a historical or you know a um famous uh historical figure yeah i mean like i said earlier this was my first um (laughs) series i had actually never stepped foot in a writer's room before this experience so I didn't know the rules. Uh, I had the pilot and I put together what people were saying that my friends were saying at the time, what have you done? I put together this like 90 page um, sort of like visual document that had like my my references and it had like, you know, a, a kind of a, a, an arc for where I wanted to go with the season and where I wanted to go beyond season one. And, and so I just sort of did, did, did that. And um, <laughs> luckily, uh, Amazon was 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 honestly f- from the start, um, and I'm not just saying this because maybe half of them are listening to this right now. <laughs> We're truly the best partners I could have imagined uh, for my first experience. I mean, they just sort of leaned in from second one, and it never really let up, um, mm. and I've had their support every you know step of the way um, since that day. So um, I don't know. That was my experience. It was really yeah. happy and yummy and fun. I wish I had some drama. I actually don't wish I had any drama. It's, <laughs> it was great. Uh, yeah. Um, the next question is actually direct. It's directed toward Barry um, and it's from Jamilo Quinn. Um, and um, who wanted to know what conversations did you have as writers in order to tell the story of the Underground Rail- Railroad with such truth, um, uh, quoting, while avoiding exploitation of Black trauma? Um, uh, one of our, one of our writers, uh, Allison Davis, the woman I, I alluded to earlier who broke or really was instrumental in breaking the Tennessee episodes. Um, she had, she's had many careers, even though she's much younger than me. Um, and she had oversaw, uh, this project, uh, the lynching project, which was just, uh, documenting, um, the sites of all these lynchings throughout the American South, uh, going back to about 1900 through present day. And so she brought an extreme sensitivity to working with that subject matter and working in in that world and working in a way that you're presenting these images to an audience. The other part of it was uh, Amazon themselves were super right from the very beginning, super, uh, super diligent about mental health. And they offered us um, sort of some mental health, if if uh, mental health uh, uh, help if we need it. Um, but they also uh, expressed that there was going to be mental health uh, experts in the field with us as we were making the show. I think, uh, and this is why it's good to be on the panel with showrunners. At the end of the day, the buck kind of stops with with you. And I feel like I had to have three different brains: director, writer, and then also just a person in the world, especially a black person in the world. And always being aware of where's the line. This might be the best thing for art, but this probably is the threshold for I think what um, us as, uh, as human beings or me as a human being can, can tolerate. And so we just tried to have it at the surface of everything. You know, as we were breaking an episode or breaking a story, especially episode one, yeah. uh, just being aware of what we were uh, putting the audience into the situations. 
and always just being aware of this is the line if we cross it and there was one point where we understood and the buck stops with me that there was going to be an image in episode one that was going to be very difficult to digest um, but I'd seen the aftermath of images like that in these postcards from the Jim Crow era, and, um, and it always stopped there. And so I thought, we have to go to this place. And so the best thing you can do is just be diligent about always being aware of where the line is, when you're approaching it, when you're crossing it, why you're crossing it. For us, it was for the character. Um, and then just uh, being honest, to, to, the reason why we had to pitch it so many times was I wanted them to hear over and over again, um, where that was the blessing of it. This is what we're doing. And, uh, and we're not going to shy away from these things. So, yeah. I love to hear from um, other, I mean, a lot of you are dealing with elements of trauma in, in your work. And I'd love to hear, you know, it's really interesting what you said, Barry, about the studio sort of having resources and, but just how, how you navigated that in, in your writer's rooms. We share a studio, and so the resources, it was very <laughs> right. the same experience for our show in terms of those resources. And I would say for the writer's room, you know, we have a we have an episode as well that was sort of halfway through our season, um, which was going to be, um, we knew from the beginning, a sort of a sock in the gut. We That said, we never wrote anything with the intention of being purposely provocative. We really wanted to be the most true and, and, and honest that we could be. And what part of our job as showrunners and, 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 and is to create um, a space. We always said sort of a safe space for dangerous things to happen. That was kind mm. of the motto for our room, um, that the folks who are making it can't feel unsafe. Otherwise, it's just chaos. And so mm. so creating an, a nurturing environment where everyone felt free enough and, and open enough to be able to kind of delve into what terrified us the most and then just honor it um, as, as fearlessly and fiercely as we could was, was the goal for, for, our, for our, our room. Yeah, that's really, that's really well put. I, th I think that um, there's a tendency, I think, yeah, what Barry was saying about the the divide between um, the thing that would be the most artistic or, versus the thing that someone has to experience. Mm -hmm. There is a difference to when you're writing something, you're kind of, you are experiencing, but you're experiencing it a different way. There is a little bit of like, I'm God. And you can sort of, so I'll be more, I tend to be more cavalier Cause it's fun. It gets fun. And you'll, you sometimes will be, will put, you'll put a character through something and it's very cathartic on the page or in the act of it. And then you're like, it is quite hard for the, um, the, the audience comes, comes to it. Particularly as the show goes on, they, they bring a lot of emotion with the character and you can sometimes it's, it really is a fine line to not be careless with that, to be very like, um, caring about what the audience has to experience as well. Yeah. Can I, 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 I step back in on this? Because because Marvin re reminded me of something, a safe, a safe space to do dangerous things. In the book, our main character, one of the catalysts for her brokenness is the fact that she suffers this, this gang rape um, on, on the plantation. And it was something that we talked about briefly in the room because it's in the book. In building the room, and it doesn't always have to be this way, but I wanted to make sure there were more women than men in the room because the protagonist is, is a woman. And so we were four women and, and, and two men was the makeup of the room. And every time we came to the subject, I could just, as a showrunner, I could feel the room getting into a state that wasn't safe. And just through observing that, it was clear, this is not going to be in the show. It's just not. The energy of it is clearly in the room, but it's yeah. not going to be in the show. It can be in the character, but it's not going to be in the show because it's in the source material. And I think to answer the, the person's question, as a showrunner, you know, you have to do awesome writing. You have to drive the story. But I think that's a part of the responsibility as well. Uh, Patrick Somerville, who was also in the, the leftovers room with me on season two, he did Station Eleven. We're, we're like neighbors now, and we talk about this this all the time. You know protecting the cast on the set, but also protecting the crew on the set and protecting um, uh, the writers. A, a safe space to do dangerous things, I think is, is really crucial. And as a showrunner, you have to decide, you know, when the space has become unsafe. Yeah. I mean, I love Molly and Sarah to weigh in because you're also dealing with domestic domestic abuse and sexual harassment in your shows as well and, ha and how you were thinking about that in context. Well, I was going to say that, I mean, every single person who worked on made 
was traumatized. <laughs> like every we, everybody was, and me too, everybody was. But I also think, I don't know about you guys, but we had the added challenge of, we, we were one of the first shows to go in the pandemic. So it was like swabs every morning, masks, plastic, like, and it's hard to check on people's mental health from six feet away. Um, and it was really challenging in that way in the shoot. Cause I feel like usually you can make, I can make eye contact with a human being and tell how they're doing, but it was really hard in the rain in Canada from six feet apart, you know? So what I did, and I, I hope I did a good job, but what I did was really relied on the department heads to be checking in with their crew and to be letting us know if anyone was having a hard time. And then I, I kept tabs on the, on the writers and the, and the cast, but like, it, it was hard to know how everyone was. I, I hope everyone's okay. You know, it was hard with the pandemic made it so hard. I can't wait to make a show not in mass from six feet away. No. <laughs> um, Sarah, yeah. Yeah, no, I just, I would just say briefly that this is one of a lot of things that Monica was very helpful with because um, there are many severely traumatic experiences from her life that we were sort of recreating. And so starting with the script to hear from her about what felt right to include and what felt not right to include. There were some things I chose not to include because it felt like I was just going to be re-traumatizing somebody. And then she told me that was a mistake because her life experience had been that everybody knew all of these things. So that was, that gave me something to sort of hold on to through the process. And then as we were shooting those scenes, um, we, I, I would FaceTime with Beanie sometimes one-on-one -on -one before or early in the process about Monica's sort of emotionality and all these things. And then Beanie was also a producer, was really great about, um, I think, approaching some of these really challenging scenes with um, a sort of with the clarity about, what, clarity about what she sort of needed. And I think we always were very mindful of the very challenging job she had to live up to this thing and then to go through these processes. So especially the later half of the season as a lot of those things start to happen. Um, I think, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of lessons I learned and things I would do again, <clears throat> uh, perhaps slightly differently on the show, but I feel felt good about um, the way we approach those scenes and sort of, especially with Monica behind it, you know, that was always something that I could lean on, you know? Yeah, definitely. I mean, this was such a great discussion. Um, we have three more question, audience questions. Um, uh, from a, a variety YouTube video um, named CJ. Um, all of your shows are in some ways political and I was curious in times of political strife, do you find yourself obligated to comment on current times or is it simply taste? I didn't feel obligated. I did not feel obligated to, to do that. It felt like any resonances would be, people could take what they needed from it. I was so tightly bound to 1992 to 2001. Um, I was wary of anything that would feel like a comment, I think. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, I think you can get, you can sometimes get, there's the temptation is always there. They're always, but you can get a bit clever. And then I think sometimes that stuff can really stand out. Yeah. And it's sort of like a chicken squawking and you're like, well, okay, I wonder what the writer thinks about that. It's, it's a temptation that I think to largely be avoided, I would, I'd pause it. Yeah. Whereas now I realize I wrote a line for Ann Coulter where she like obviously talking about bad presidents. So. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. Good on you. <laughs> um, uh, a question from Ann Cherkis is how many weeks did your writer's rooms go and were you able to negotiate with the studio and network if you felt you initially weren't given enough time to execute at the level you wanted? I mean, again, I think pandemic made everything weird. So mm -hmm. I feel like anything we say should probably have the asterisks of it was weird. It was a pandemic. <laughs> did, did, did you do a virtual room? Did you guys do a virtual room? We were in person for exactly half and then we moved gotcha. to Zoom. So I did, I started in January and we finished at the end of May. What is that? 20? I don't know. But then when we finished, we finished because it was on Zoom and it was just like mm. incredibly hard. And we were going to production in another country during a pandemic. And like it, just nothing about our process was normal. Um, the, the really good thing was that we were a very small room. Mm -hmm. And so even though the room wrapped, um, when production went, I feel like we were all in touch. You know, it was a little bit like it, I've been in rooms with 10 writers and it, it's a, it's got a more formal feel. Made was always sort of gentle because it was just a handful of us. But I guess the answer is our room was 
20 weeks and we did not extend because we didn't know if we were making a show or not. <laughs> Pandemic. How many weeks do the rest of you have? Let's just go rapid fire on the room to answer the question. Don't make me answer this. <laughs> okay, no. <laughs> I said earlier, uh, 10 weeks, we were 10 yeah. weeks. I think we had 20 weeks in like late in like summer 2019. Um, and that was it, I'm pretty sure. I have no recollection whatsoever. <laughs> and it's sort of another iteration as well. So it was like, yeah. it, uh, it, it sort of dragged. Uh, and then we were down. Uh, it seemed unclear whether we'd shot enough to even continue. Be like, well, I don't know if we're gonna keep, like, does this go in the bin? It was really early on. It was, yeah. Um, it was sort of like, no, they're in New York. Like, they're going to keep shooting. Like, sure, there's some, there's like this pneumonia coming. And then like two days later, it's like, no, 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 it's, it's a pandemic. Yeah. Um, I, I actually just want to take the opportunity. I, I promised my room I would do this to embarrass them. But this is, <laughs> this is my room. I don't know if it's on camera. Um, yeah, it's there. <laughs> they were they were an awesome group. Uh, oh, really, really. It's a shame that the thing is virtual, man. It's actually really yeah. fun at WGA Awards. You kind of just get get tanked on wine and champagne, and <laughs> they don't get that opportunity, man. They don't I know. I'm really sad. Too. I'm really sad. I wanted to meet all of you in person. Yeah. This is this has been my favorite of the virtual things. I, I gotta say, it's a. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like we're we're all getting a taste of each other's personality. It's, Absolutely. You know, and for all the people watching, it's like this is what this is what writers are like, man. We're just, we just we just kind of want to be hugged, man. We just be <laughs> Speaking of the awards, the last audience question. I'm 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 positive this is probably going to embarrass most of you, but because it's Paul. Um, and Paula, it's a great question. Um, Paula Svenbergen asks, Madi CSI, did you know that what you were working on was special or nominee worthy while you were working on it? I think you always like it that's the only thing that keeps me going you know like it always seems great you're like yeah you just <laughs> never expect to be right you know and it's such a we you never know there's so many shows now you know there's 300 shows 500 shows like it's really um so you feel very fortunate when it sort of uh comes through this was a very 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 pleasant surprise mm. I'm going out of body even being asked that, like sitting here. I mean, I'm Barry Jenkins is on the panel. <laughs> you guys are on the panel. I'm literally out of body right now. Again, this is my first experience of making television. So I am, <laughs> it's it's sort of an embarrassment of riches. It's been that from the beginning, but then to see it come here, I think, I, I no, I mean, this has just continued to exceed every kind of dream I could have had about what this could possibly be over and over and over again. Um, and it continues sitting with this group. So the short answer is like, wow, <laughs> just wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I share a birthday with Charlie Kaufman and, and I also share a bit of his neuroses. So hell no, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know or think this was going to be special. I was pretty terrified, but, uh, but but I, I I always like talking about the the baby writers and uh, Adrian Rush, who's the the Faulkner zealot, who was our writers room's assistant. I remember I was touring with uh, Bill Street, or I just finished Bill Street. And I was in London, and I got her draft of the Great Spirit, and the Great Spirit's not even in the book, so it's like we're off off the beaten path. And I kind of just threw this at her. She wasn't expecting to get an episode, and when it came in, and it was fucking good. I didn't think it was going to be special, but I had this like special feeling because it was like, like just watching somebody just grow, you know, and also her voice. And this is for somebody who always writes their own stuff being like, holy shit, I wasn't capable of doing this. And here, this person, they, they did it, you know, with me, for me. And now we get to go off and make this thing. So that felt really special. But hell no, man. No, no. Ian, I want some of your juice, bro. I <laughs> just total yeah. arrogance. <laughs> it's really scary. I, I thought made it so bad that I had a sign up in my office that said, you will not be the worst show on Netflix. I reminded myself. Of <laughs> <laughs> like, That's no the matter, Charlie Kaufman school of writing. Yeah, yes. like, I was like, no matter, like, that was the only solace I had was like, well, we won't be the worst show on Netflix. Like, mm -hmm. no, um, no, I think I, you know, I was terrified of, of um, not telling the story well and uh, but I will say, like, I think I remember the first time I watched um, set, 
the first time I went to set and I'm a playwright. So I'm used to watching the audience to watch how they like a play. Like you, you don't watch the play as a playwright, you watch the audience. And I watched the crew watch Margaret and I watched people go like this, you know, and I was like, I, I think this might, it might be truthful, which felt, mm -hmm. felt special. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you, when you see the guys at Crafty, like she's really powerful. That's a good sign. <laughs> I think Sarah, you're the only one that has an answer, and I don't want no, to. No, of course, on the spot. no. I 100 percent no. I just live in terror and self criticism all the time. No, I'm. It's <laughs> wonderful to spend this evening because it's on the East Coast with you guys. I'm shocked and very flattered. Um, well, we're gonna wrap up. I did want to go around the room, the room, um, and ask what everyone's working on next, just so the audience can get a, get excited for what's coming next. Um, Ian, you're sort of first on my Zoom, so I'll ask. So uh, you'll you. Go first. Yeah, two uh, just uh, post finishing post on uh, anthology series called Monster. The first season of which is the Jeffrey Dahmer story, which is a ten episode like deep, 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 deep dive into like a very, 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 very fascinating, scary, scary story, uh, which was in incredible. You, uh, you and Peter, you and uh, you and Peters, Evan Peters um, plays the lead, and just like again within like thirty seconds, you're like, oh, he got it. He's doing it. Um, and then just finishing this the last week of shooting for a limited series called The Watcher, which is based on a, a true story, an article that came out in 2015 about a family who moves into this house in New Jersey and then starts getting these threatening letters that are really, really eerie, like targeting a family. And, and they like there's blood in the walls, like, thanks for bringing, where do your children sleep? Like really, really creepy or true story. So, um, so moving into some like uh, some horror thriller area soon I, i'm not sure when but they, anyway both of those coming this this season hello marvin i i know you're, you it sounds like you're working on season two of coven of of them yeah yeah uh our writers uh who i love dearly are are diligently at work as we speak um mm -hmm. on the second season so very excited about that i'm excited uh, <laughs> uh sarah what what do you have on the table um i don't know i've been writing a play and i'm writing some other sort of TV things that I'm still figuring out, just sort of yelling at myself in my office about. That's what's going on right now for me. <laughs> um, Barry? I'm, uh, I'm parked at the Mouse House, so I'm working on yeah. uh, this Lion King prequel and um, and also working on the, this movie about Alvin Ailey. So it's been inter interesting yeah. to listen to yeah. you and Sarah talk about working with, you know, people who actually existed in reality. Some of them were still alive and and just, you know, again, where the line is in that. So, so, so thank you guys for being so, so clear and honest about, about work on those projects. Same. Um, and Molly. I'm writing a play, but don't tell anyone. No, it's <laughs> you just told everybody. <laughs> you told the whole. <laughs> I'm, writing the I'm writing a play because it's like, use it or lose it, you know? And I spent so much time in that couch with Margaret Qualley that I'm afraid I'm not a playwright anymore. So I'm writing a play. And then I, I just set up camp at Netflix, which I'm really excited about. So I just um, joined them. And so whatever I do next will be with them. And I think my first project is that I'm going to adapt a different play of mine into a limited. So that's what I'm thinking about. That's great. This was wonderful. I want to thank you all so, so much um, for being here with us. Um, I want to thank our viewers from the WGA and I want to thank our viewers on Variety. Um, thank you all so much and congrats on your nominations, everyone. Have a great rest of your evening. Thank you, Esther. Oh, well, thanks, Love Esther. Meeting everybody. Okay. Nice meeting you all. Meeting all of you. Later, guys. Bye. Bye.